here we are. I just did a fun ADHD questionnaire for mm. for the podcast, and I uh, flying colors hundred hundred percent. Every every single question <laughs> on the questionnaire was the most extreme ADHD answer that a, that a person um, could have. So, uh, uh, what are, what are your thoughts on this? In in terms of in in a world where everyone's on um, WebMD, what what issues do you see with this yeah. of of some of the overdiagnosis that happens? Well, I have a lot to say about this, so. Sure. Like, and I'm going to try to remember all the things I want to say, because that's hard for me sometimes. Um, so the first thing I would say is like, I mean, yes, people do self-diagnose. I mean, I, I diagnose people for a living, so I feel like okay with that. And since I have yeah. like, you know, family members with it, I feel like extra okay with it. Um, so, I mean, what, what I would say is, so ADHD is rule in and rule out. And so you, there's a lot of symptoms with ADHD that look like, um, or there's a lot of other symptoms with other uh, disorders that look like ADHD, right? So you rule in the symptoms, which actually often isn't that hard. A lot of people can like, you know, um, like they will endorse the fact that they have those symptoms. That being said, that's why a careful clinical interview is so important. Because so for me, one of the big ones is trauma. So there's a lot of people who have like a history, especially if it's a history of complex trauma where it started in childhood. So then some of these symptoms are appearing in childhood um, because, you know, ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disability. So it has to have started in childhood. Um, but there's a lot of symptoms of trauma that mimic ADHD. And so sometimes differentiating that is really hard. Um, and I, and I think that a good clinical interview can be helpful and just like, you know, really asking questions about what that, ex you know, when they're talking about a particular symptom, like, tell me more about that. Explain what that's like. So you can really get a sense of, you know, does this seem like ADHD or does this seem like something else? Oh, can I go? Can yeah. I go? <laughs> um, so I actually do have a formal, formal diagnosis of ADHD, but this was given like way Show back off. in... <laughs> <laughs> um, way back when, when there were, were different subtypes and it was, um, you know, I just did it more at, at an age where I wanted just the gratification of, of having other people almost like recognize that this is why I, I am the way I am. Um, you know, that being said, kind of similar to Claire, I think that, you know, seeing a lot of children with ADHD, it's, it's easy to kind of trace back, you know, those symptoms. Now, I think a big part of it is really being able to analyze whether you're a parent or an adult or anything in between how much of it is really impacting your life. So in terms of function versus dysfunction. That's um, yeah. And I think that's a really, really big thing. Like a lot of people are walking around um, with like ADHD symptoms, but are they able to manage? Is it taxing like emotionally? Is it, you know, making their job harder? All of these things kind of come into play. And then I also think there's a lot of other things that go into specifically symptoms of ADHD, including, um, you know, how well your quality of sleep and also going along with that, even just um, like if you are mouth breathing too, that can impact, um, you know, like also it goes into, they're all related, right? Everything's always related. So we're just wait, 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 wait. I'm, I'm sorry. Could you go back there? What did you just say? Some, what, what was the thing about mouth breathing? Um, so if you breathe through your mouth, which can be related to more like tethered oral tissues or, um, you know, just like for structural reasons, let's say. So you don't have your tongue rest on your palate. And this is like a whole different discussion. But when you are sleeping, then what happens is that you breathe through your mouth and then your body sends a shot of adrenaline every like 20 to 30 seconds to wake yourself up. So you essentially can breathe through your mouth. And then from that, you're unable to get into a deep sleep. So then you have these kids um, and adults who are chronically tired and then the way that it presents when you're chronically tired to wake yourself up um, is you look like kind of like this tornado. You have presentation like ADHD. It's really hard to concentrate on one thing and you're kind of like running around. So I think a lot of people are just chronically tired too. Ah, is that my thing? <laughs> is that, <laughs> it, if it I just be. found out that's what I've had in my whole life, I'm going to be upset with myself for not getting an actual maybe i should have been like ah whatever i got the thing maybe you can get a sleep test and see can, you know your quality huh. of sleep can mm -hmm. I, I, what, what, 
Uh, no, Claire, you can't say anything. I'm talking to Natalie here. <laughs> All right, Claire, what do you have to say? Um, well, what I wanted to say is, I mean, ADHD is more than just like, I mean, I think we think of, a, you know, hyperactive kids who are running around, right? Or like inattention, distractibility, but it is more than that. I mean, there's something called goal-directed persistence, you know, so staying focused on, on tough tasks. I mean, typically with ADHD, you would also see executive functioning impairment, which I am like, that's another rabbit hole. Um, and emotional dysregulation and emotional, as well. Yes. And I think I actually think that there's a lot of people. So in addition to the fact that there's people who are diagnosed with ADHD who should who do not have ADHD, there are people who are not diagnosed with ADHD and they're diagnosed with something else and they have ADHD. And, and I think the emotional dysregulation really throws a lot of people off um, because I think like one of the especially if it's it's not somebody who you know is in the field, like so, sometimes people will make. Um, comments like, oh, it must be bipolar, right? Because their mood is all over the place. Or, But but mm -hmm. emotional dysregulation is definitely, you know, a big part of ADHD. And so I think that that's often missed um, and it's mistaken for other things. And emotional dysregulation really can be like, like having emotional outbursts. Like I cannot regulate my emotions. So it, it goes along with that impulsivity, right, Claire? Yes, but it's also so there's like emotional clarity. It's like, how am I doing right now? And then there's that ability like so there's these other like underlying kind of building block skills that would be kind of like more like uh, executive functioning type skills. So like inhibiting. Uh, so stopping yourself from doing something that you want to do. Um, and if that, that that's the impulsivity. Right. And so if that's impacted, then um, that would affect the emotional outbursts. Right. Like you are having a hard time keeping yourself from having this outburst and, and maybe mm. you're not aware of how you're, how you're feeling at this moment. Um, and, and so, um, I mean, there's other things that go with it too, but I mean, and you could even think of like metacognition, right? Like your ability to know, like, how am I doing like sort of just compared to other people? I mean, there's just a bunch of things that go into the emotional dysregulation. I feel like a bunch of building block pieces. I do think though that, and Claire and I talk about this quite a bit is, um, you know, whenever you have a symptom or a behavior or an issue that is impacting your life in a more dysfunctional way, you have to look at um, the most foundational level and build up from there. Mm. So for example, like ADHD is a very complex, as Claire just out, like laid out a very complex diagnosis and there's a lot of different pieces to it. So, um, you know, going from there, figuring out what's the most foundational level. So that's why, you know, for me, when I see clients, a lot of times I'm looking at sleep and their quality of sleep, because that's going to impact like just like their behavior during the day and how they feel. Um, same thing with like nutrition mm -hmm. and also that's going to impact how they feel. Um, a lot of children that, you know, we work with uh, who have processing disorders also have trouble processing food like into their gut. So that can, you know, lead to chronic inflammation and then some other things. Um, but, um, and, you know, we refer huh. out for nutritionists, but just looking at, you know, the very foundational stuff like sleep, eating, 